So a sorcerer is contracted by a king to curse Israel, but God tells him not to curse Israel, and then gives him permission to go, but not say anything. But then sends a warrior angel to block the sorcerer's path, even though God gave him permission to go. The sorcerer doesn't see the angel, but the donkey who does see the angel kind of stops along the way, doesn't want to go any further, ends up getting hit, and finally ends up talking. That's weird. You know, sorcerers who can bless and curse are weird enough in our modern world. We don't think of presidents and prime ministers employing sorcerers to curse their enemies these days. But God's actions are also weird. I don't know why God gave Balaam permission to go and then block the path. I do not understand it. It is a mystery, but it is not a mystery without precedence. Because there are other places in Scripture where God tells someone to go and then blocks their path. It's weird, but it's not uncommon. God told Jacob to go back home. You've been gone far too long. And then God sent an angel to jump Jacob at the Jabbok River and fight him all night long. God told Moses to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt in the fourth chapter of Exodus, and when he stopped at a hotel on the way, a Motel 6, God tried to kill him. Don't go to Motel 6. Don't actually do that. They'll get mad at me and yell at me for uh, saying, don't go to Motel 6. God told Joshua to lead the children of Israel into the promised land and then send a warrior angel from the Lord's army with his sword drawn and block Joshua's way. I do not know why God would tell you to go and then block your way. That's weird. But what's really interested readers of the Bible, young and old, is how this donkey started talking. Now, I love a talking donkey as much as the next person, especially if voiced by Eddie Murphy. But I have to admit, I find it weird to read about a talking animal in the Bible. The only other creature to talk in Scripture was that slippery, sly snake in Genesis 3. However, that snake was working against God, but this donkey was working for God. See, even the spectacular loses its luster if it's not in the service of God. It's not just enough to be involved in miraculous things. You have to be on the right side of the miracle. Now, how did a donkey, a stubborn, recalcitrant beast of burden, end up talking? But what I think is even more important for us to consider is not how the donkey talked, but why. To discover the why, we have to know the context of the story, because a text without a context is just a pretext. So we have to rewind the scriptures to go back as far as we need to go to get to that place where we can discover together how it came to be that a fighting angel was blocking the path of a talking donkey being beaten by a shaky sorcerer from Mesopotamia. Now, if we go back to the beginning of the book of Numbers, we will see that this donkey was not talking. In the opening chapters of Numbers, almost all the chapters begin in the same way. The Lord spoke to Moses. God was doing the talking in the opening chapters of Numbers. In fact, in its early history, the book was titled, Yahweh Spoke. The important thing is, at the beginning of the book, God is doing the talking. Moses is listening and translating what God said to the people. God talks, the people listen and obey. That's how it's meant to be, but how it rarely is. We have a hard time listening and a harder time obeying. We find gods of convenience that rubber stamp our choices, our actions, and our philosophies. We gravitate toward voices that reinforce what we already believe to be true about God and politics, life and values and justice. If we receive a message we don't like, we can always change the channel or the church. The Israelites often changed the channel to to other gods, to idols, from Baal to Asherah to golden calves. So in the opening chapter of Numbers, God is talking. 
relaying it to Moses, and Moses relays it to the children of Israel, all God's instructions, teachings, and best ways. And the children of Israel said, we will do it. And they did not do it. Now, if they had done it, they had listened to God and acted upon what God said, there'd have been no need for a donkey to talk. But when doubt and mistrust come in, it gets us into trouble. Now, if you look at God's dealing with Israel from the time they left Egyptian bondage to when they arrived in the promised land, everything God had promised Israel had come to pass. God did it just like God promised. God provided and guided. God protected and connected the people of Israel. God was so good to Israel and is to us, but the goodness doesn't last very long on our side. And it didn't for Israel either, because before long they start grumbling and complaining and finally broke out in complete rebellion. They complained about the weather in the desert. It's hot out here. There's no AC. They complained about the food. We're going to need something more than this manna. It's getting old and tired. And at the very land that God promised them, they rejected saying, We don't have the strength to inhabit that. Can't we just go back to Egypt? Israel engaged in a season of rebellion and disobedience, so much so that by the time we get to the 22nd chapter of Numbers, Moses is silent, Aaron and Miriam are dead, a dubious diviner is prophesying, and the donkey on whom he is riding is doing the best talking and making the most sense. Now that's the why. God will always find a way and will use whatever means necessary to stay true to God's word and faithful to God's promises. And God promised to bless Israel despite their grumbling and rebellion. So Balaam and his donkey come into our view by the way of a frightened king named Balak. When the children of Israel entered his territory through the plains of Moab on the way to the promised land, he got nervous because he had already heard reports that the folks who had whipped him had gotten beaten by Israel. So he was nervous. It's like when you're watching football and you realize, you know, the Eagles beat the Cowboys and the Cowboys beat the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Really, the Eagles could beat the Buccaneers so they could be Super Bowl champions. Do you ever think like that? We're not with the Eagles. They stink this year. uh, No no offense. But the the Cowboys will stink too. But we think like that. If they they beat us and somebody else beat them, they must be even better. This king was nervous. He didn't think he had any way to defeat the Israelites, so he hired Balaam to curse Israel. Now, Balaam was a sorcerer. He was known as a hired gun. His only weapons were words, but his words could bless you or curse you. So King Balak wanted to hire Balaam to curse Israel so he could more easily defeat them. Well, unbeknown to Balak, God also wanted to hire Balaam. King Balak sent his men to Balaam with fees in their hand to hire him, but what they didn't realize is before they got there, God had already put Balaam on heaven's payroll. Isn't that just like God? Well, we're still trying to figure it out. God's already worked it out. And when they got, to their, they got there and made their pleas, Balaam said, I can't go with you right now. I got to go talk to God. And this from a sorcerer who had no particular allegiance to Yahweh as a mercenary sorcerer. But Balaam said, I got to go and talk to God and see what God says. And that night God said, don't go and don't curse Israel. And so Balaam got up the next morning and told the king's men, can't go with you because God told me not to go, so I cannot go. Now Balak was a king. He wasn't going to take no for an answer because he was afraid. We're often stubborn when we're afraid. So he sent more important emissaries with nicer gifts, this time with Apple products instead of PC products, to Balaam. And Balaam asked God again, and God said, fine, fine, go on. I know you want that new iPhone, but I tell you what, you don't say any more than I tell you to say. And I mean it. So Balaam saddled up his donkey, started toward the land of Moab, and God's anger was kindled against him, and God sent an angel to block the road. God sent a fighting angel. Now this isn't a serene-looking, long-haired beauty with a harp lounging on a cloud. It's not a fat baby in a diaper with a little mini teeny bow with a little rubber tip on it. 
There's a reason why whenever an angel appears in Scripture, the first words always have to be, hey, don't, don't, don't fear. I know I'm scared. Look, I got a giant sword, but don't fear. Because a fighting angel is a terrifying sight. And that donkey saw the angel in the row with his sword drawn, and she understood this was one of God's fighting angels. So the donkey turned aside into the field, and Balaam struck the donkey. And when they got to a place with a wall on either side, the angel once again tried to block their way, and the donkey evaded him. It scraped Balaam's poor little foot against the wall. And so the prophet struck that poor beast again. And the third time, the angel chose to appear in a place where there was nowhere the donkey could go. So it just laid down under its master, and Balaam was furious. He took his staff, and he beat his donkey with it. Then the donkey spoke out, What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? Now pause for a moment. The weirdest thing about this story is not the fact that donkey suddenly started talking. I think it's Balaam's response. He didn't say, whoa, when did you learn to talk or otherwise freak out? Instead, he told the donkey that if he had had a sword, he would have killed it for making a fool of him. Do you ever have that feeling of embarrassment when your dog chooses just the moment the neighbor's looking to do something disobedient? Or if not a dog, perhaps your child. And you're just like, why are you embarrassing me in front of my friends? Now, Balaam wasn't as worried about his sore foot as he, wore about, as he was about his sore ego, having a disobedient donkey before all the important officials of King Balak. And the donkey replied, Haven't I been your faithful beast your entire life? Have I ever behaved this way before? And the prophet was forced to concede, No, it had not. And then his eyes were opened, and he saw the angel. And you heard how the angel scolded Balaam for abusing his donkey and then repeated the message, Go with the men, but speak only what I tell you to speak. So Balaam went with the men, and Balak was irritated that he had taken so long, but had built altars, made sacrifices, and waited for Balaam to speak his oracle to curse the Hebrew people. But Balaam said only what the Lord told him to say, and three times, from three different places, Balaam blessed the Hebrew people. Balak was furious and said he would pay Balaam no money at all. And Balaam simply replied, I already said that even if you gave me all the silver and gold in your house, I could say nothing other than what the Lord God has told me to say. You know, in this story, the donkey could see what Balaam could not. It's a common theme in Scripture. Sometimes when we're not looking, we miss it. We don't even recognize Jesus. The donkey could see what Balaam could not. The angel of the Lord made out for war holding a sword in his hand. Because the donkey responds to the angel rather than to Balaam, it saved Balaam's life. The angel could have killed Balaam, but the donkey put up with the beatings and saved its master's life. The donkey was doing what Israel should have been doing, responding and obeying the messages of God, rather than the whims, passions, and desires of men and women and the gods they create out of convenience. See, God speaks. Yahweh speaks. That was the name of the book in the Hebrew Scriptures. God spoke and God's word was true and found fulfillment. God still speaks and God's promises still find fulfillment. God's word is still true and reliable and just and the best way to live. But if we don't hear God, if we continue on our own path, oblivious to God's word, God's ways, God's messengers, who will speak for God? God has used prophets and priests, priests, ravens and murderers, stutterers and shepherd's boys, unwed teenage mothers and self-righteous Pharisees, and wise, faithful, seeing support donkeys. God will use anyone and anything to get God's message through. So how and through whom is God trying to speak to you? What are you missing? What are you not seeing that's right in front of your face that somehow God is trying to alert you? Sometimes the people and things we may not consider much may deserve the most consideration. 
especially if for whatever reason they are trying to speak God's truth and show you what you have not been able to see or refuse to see. Because we miss so much. There's so much we cannot see or often choose not to see. The other side. The underbelly. The inconvenient truth. The shadowy past. The victims. And the violators. We are, as blind, we are so blind to so many things in our world. As Balaam was to God's angel. He needed a new voice to help him receive a new set of eyes. Last week I was doing youth Bible study and talking to some of the youth, and it was interesting that there was so much about history they had never talked about in school before. Never heard anything about lynching, didn't even know what that word was. High school students. Never really talked about slavery in this country much. You knew it existed. Didn't know much about the treatment of Native Americans or immigrants. There's so much in our history that has helped create who we are today that we just don't want to have to teach. We don't want to have to learn about. We don't want to have to see. It's like, I don't want to go to a meat processing plant because I really like meat. I like chicken. I like bacon. I don't want to see sometimes how it gets made. Is there, are there things like that for you? You don't want to see. Because you're afraid if you see, you're going to have to change your mind. You're going to have to actually deal with it. We sometimes like this idea, ignorance is bliss. If I don't know, I don't have to deal with it. I don't have to change. And so we close our eyes. And we get mad at everybody else who's seeing and trying to help us until finally someone speaks. And maybe it's a donkey or a friend or a neighbor or a stranger, and our eyes are opened, and we see what maybe we've been missing. Maybe what could save our own life, or someone else's, or be a blessing, or a curse. So consider, who hasn't historically been able to speak? Whose voices have too long been silent? and shut. Who may be able to see what we ourselves are missing? And I think you know those answers for yourselves. We need to look who's talking now, because maybe it's our turn to listen. And who knows who or what might be saved if we take the time to hear a new voice and see with new eyes what's been right in front of us all along. Let us pray together. Almighty God, we are thankful that you are always faithful to your promises. You will always make a way through a wilderness, through a sea, through the voice of a donkey. Your promises always find fulfillment, even if it means through a death on a cross. Your promises are always true. Lord, we thank you for those promises. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. And be on the lookout for what you are doing in the world. Even if it's a hard truth. Even if it's a painful sight. Help us to see and hear where you need us to go. And what you need us to do. Because you so love the world. You want us to do the same. And you will stop at nothing, not even making a donkey speak, to give that message to us that you so love the world. Amen.